All right, this is the beginning of a requested class called Bible Hermeneutics. First thing you're going to be tested on is how do you spell hermeneutics? <laughs> um, we're going to be looking tonight at some introductory things and uh, inductive Bible study and some basics. Here's the first exercise I want us to do. I want you to not use your translation, but use this one and pretend the King James is your preferred translation for this exercise, because we're going to make a point from this. I want you to look at that, and I'm going to give you two to three minutes. Read it as many times as you can and start writing things you learn. If you're learning from it, and this is not what you're learning, but that Jesus was raised from the dead, write that down. If you learn that he's proved to be the Son of God by that, write that down. See if you can get five, six, seven things you learn from that, and we'll start the clock, and you just be looking at that and see what you can list that you learn. All right, that's two to three minutes. I'm not sure exactly how long that was, but um, I know that's kind of rushed, but in interest of time, let's stop there. I'm not interested in what you listed. We don't have time for that, but how many found five things that you listed? Show of hands. All right, several of you found five. Did anybody find as many as six? Seven? Eight? Somebody found eight? All right. Here's what I want us to do with that. Here's a snapshot. What we just did is kind of a snapshot of how you study the Bible. And we kind of have to pretend that we spent more time with that text. We're going to do that several times. Because of time crunch, we're going to pretend we spent more time on some things. For example, when we do a word study a little later, we'll pretend we had searched out several uh, references on that. So we, we've studied this, and so... Uh, we've read this passage over and over, and here's kind of what we have, have just done. But before I list that, though, I might suggest to you that um, do you think that maybe the person who found five and you only found four, that as we compare lists, that that's go you're going to begin to see things that you didn't see when you read it? Is that true? 
and the person's got several of you had five, and the person who has five and another person has five things they found, that's probably not a matching list. So that may be more like eight things when we combine the list. Would you agree with that? All right. And I ask you to look at the King James. Do you think it would help if you went to another translation? Yeah, it would. And uh, for example, this uh, phrase called you into the grace of God into another gospel, which is not another. That's why I had you look at the King James. It sounds contradictory. And what we may find as we do a word study, now I check several translations, and the other translations make a little more sense, it seems. And so let's pretend we've looked at about 10 translations. That's helping us to understand. I might want to look at this word another, and I might find the word another in verse 6 is a different word than the word another in verse 7. In verse 6, when it says, called you unto another gospel, that means another of a different kind. Which is not another, verse 7, that's another of the same kind. It's not the same word in the original. Now that's going to enhance my understanding, isn't it? All right, here's what we just did. We read and we reread the text repeatedly. How many of you read it five, at least five times while we were doing that? Several of you. All right. So we read and reread the text repeatedly. We, we were looking at it from the vantage point. What did it mean to the first recipient? That's one of the questions that comes to our mind. We started noting things we learned from that text. We compared translations. Let's pretend we had time to do that. And we checked the meaning of words. And then we benefit from what others have to say. Would you agree? If we were to compare the list? Because I've found eight things and you have found five or four, I guarantee there's something on your five or four that I don't have on my eight. So I'm going to increase my list to maybe 12 before it's through. Does that make sense? And you'll make, we'll see some, some play on that. That, my friends, is what's involved in hermeneutics. We just exercise the principle of hermeneutics on a simple, basic level. Does that make sense? So if you're wondering what is hermeneutics all about, it has to do with going to the text and exercising principles of interpretation of how to do that. Now, did you notice this, that the, when you read it through the first time, you saw something, you read it through again, you saw something else. Did you notice that? In one of the books, I've, I've read numerous books here recently on hermeneutics and how to study the Bible. One of the books by Richard Hayhew, How to Study the Bible, he presents these squares. How many squares do you see? And on the cursory first look at that, you obviously say there are 16 squares, right? But you look a little closer and you realize, you know what? I forgot the outer square and there's one in the middle. There's actually 18 there. Oh, but wait a minute. I look at it again and there's actually 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. There are 26 squares there. But let's look again. There happens to be 27, 28, 29, 30. His point in that is, the more you look, you finish my sentence, the more you see. The more we study, the more we see things we didn't see before. In studying Daniel for Daniel, I read Daniel 1 more times than I normally read a text before I teach it. I just read it through, and I'll tell you why in a few moments. Read it through, 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 read it through. And then somebody in, in a, commentator, a commentary made a point and reference that's found in chapter 1. I thought, no, it's not. I went back and read it, and guess what? It was. I saw it that time. That's one of the things we're going to emphasize in this class. I want to tell you about a book that has, a pro, has had a profound impact. And this is just a recent book that, to me, it's an old book from the turn of the century. I had a friend of mine, in talking about this class, recommended this book. And it's how to, how to master the English Bible. If you want to buy it and read it, you can read it in, uh, in maybe, you know, an hour, two hours at the most. And it's only 70 pages, it's, but it only has one point. But it's had a profound impact. The point is, you master the Bible by reading the Bible. You master the Bible by reading the Bible. The story is, and I'll tell you the quick version of it, this, this is a denominational preacher. This preacher, who thought he knew his Bible, talked to a layman and he saw in this layman that this layman had a certain amount of peace about him that he had never seen anywhere before. And he asked the layman, how did you gain that peace? And he said, from a study of the book of Ephesians. And the preacher said, you know, I've studied Ephesians, I've taught Ephesians, I know Ephesians, and I haven't received that kind of peace, and I didn't get all of that out of Ephesians. 
And the layman said, what I did is I took the book of Ephesians and went out in the field and I sat down and opened it up and I read it from, from beginning to end in its entirety in one setting. And then I read it again and then I read it again and then I read it again and I read it again. And then I went into the house and guess what? I read it again and I read it again and I read it again until I'd read it 50 times. And the preacher said, I learned something from the layman about Bible study that I had never done in all my years of preaching. And so the book is about, you just read the Bible, just read, just read it. And you read it continuous, uh, continuously in one setting. I don't mean the whole Bible, but you, you read a book in one setting. That is, you read all the way through and ignore the chapter divisions. Read it repeatedly, and, and your, the goal is to read it 50 times, the book suggests, and read it independently of comments. Go to comments later, but read it 50 times before you delve into trying to interpret the book. And as I read that book, that had a profound impact. If, if, when this 17 lessons are through, if you walk away and say, you know what, the greatest thing I learned is I'm going to spend more time with the text, reading the text, and looking at the text, our time's going to be well spent. This will be one of the richest studies you've ever done. So I'm going to issue a challenge here. Next trimester, we're going to be in on Sunday morning dealing with 1 John. So before that class, during this trimester, I want to challenge you to read 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, those three epistles together. Read it at least 50 times by the end of this class, that which is in April. Now that's not hard to do because you can read it in 15 minutes. If you're a slow reader, you can read it in, in, in 30 minutes. If you're a fast reader, you can read it in about 7. It doesn't take that long to read 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. So start reading 1 John, read it once a day, and, if, and that's, we've got about 80 days or a little more than 80 days. Some of you will read it 100 times, some of you will read it 80, some of you will do it about 40. But if you'll make it a goal, I want to try to read that 50 times, and we're going to check throughout the series, not so much what you've learned, but are you seeing things after the 10th time you didn't see it first, and what about the 20th time now, and what about the 30th time, and when we get through, what impact did that have, or are you going to be able to say, you know what, that didn't do anything for me. I didn't learn any more about 1 John than I knew before. I just kept reading and reading, but didn't learn anything. Let's see what it does. You, you, with each reading, you're going to see more and try to look at another translation sometime. Maybe one day say, I'm going to pick up the English Standard. I'll read the New King James or maybe the New American Standard. Maybe I see something else in that translation. Take note of key concepts like the word abide or maybe the concepts of love or contrast. John is a writer of contrast. What's he contrast? And you'll begin to see all of that. Does that make sense? I think you'll find that's one of the better part of this study, and it's just something you're going to do on your own. Just read, and then just read, and then read, and then read it again, and read it again, and master the book of first, second, books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Now let's start with what is hermeneutics. I wanna, uh, we're going to spend uh, several more minutes with some introductory thoughts and introduce some ideas and lay some foundation. We're only going to get to one of our passages this evening that has been assigned. We'll take the other one and save it for next week. And we'll say more about that in a moment. Just what is hermeneutics? Well, simply put, it's the science of interpretation. It's the science of interpretation. Biblical hermeneutics is the science of, of interpreting the Bible. It's borrowed, that concept or that word is borrowed from Greek mythology. Hermes was a messenger of the gods and an interpreter of Jupiter. Terry says in his book, Biblical Hermeneutics, that hermeneutics properly begins and aims to establish the principles and methods and rules which are needful to unfold the sense of what is written. Just that science of trying to determine what, what is it that's been written, what does it mean? And Hughes makes this point, and I'm going to paraphrase that. He's just saying that here, that because there is a distance between what was written and what we read, a distance of time, then we need some tools to interpret and understand that. Because we might not understand the culture, we might not understand the history, we may not stand at, understand at first the language that is used. Like in 1 John, why does the word no keep being used? There's a reason for that. And so those are the kinds of things that may be involved. We all use hermeneutics every day. When somebody says to you something and they use figurative language and you just interpret it as figurative language, not literal, you just exercise hermeneutics, didn't you? We use it every day. You just may not know how to spell it. It's just something we do every day in our language. Now let's use, talk about another word that's different and that's the word exegesis. Uh, what is exegesis about? 
It comes from a compound word which means to lead or guide out. To lead out. Dungan says, and that's one of the, uh, that's a classic that has been used among brethren and in colleges on biblical hermeneutics, that it's the application of the principles of hermeneutics and bringing out the meaning. So when we're exegeting a text, we take those principles of hermeneutics and exercise those and we use those and then we exegete the text. Make sense? That's what exegesis involves. Terry says that it means that we should, uh, we should not fail to note that the science of interpretation must essentially depend on exegesis for maintenance and illustration of the principles and rules. So we have principles and rules that we go by. We're going to list those tonight, some of those anyway. And what exegesis has to do is taking those rules and putting them into practice so that we, we lift out the meaning of that text. And that's what we're trying to do. So what is hermeneutics? It has to do with principles and rules that are used to interpret the text. There are certain rules we have to follow. Or, or the text becomes meaningless and it becomes nonsense. And you'll see that here in just a moment. Now, we have to be taught. So, sometimes people in this kind of setting will say, you know what, I don't have to be taught to read, uh, study the Bible. You just read it and, you, you, and that's all that's involved. Yet, I want to suggest we're taught how to pray. Acts 8, a man said, how can I accept some man guide me? Remember that? Somebody needs to guide me. We need to be taught how to study, how, what the text says. Nehemiah 8 makes the point that Ezra said that uh, he gave them the sense. On the other hand, we need to understand the Bible was not written for scholars, but as one writer said, it was written for sinners. I like that. It's written for sinners so for them to understand about the Christ and the message of the Christ. So it can't be so complicated we can't understand it, can it? It's written for the common man. The common people heard Jesus gladly. Now here's where we're going with this class, and these are subject to change. So don't hold me to these, because I may change some of this, but we're going to look at background, we're going to look at context, we're going to look at outlining the text, uh, Bible study aids that will help us, the use of translations, we're going to look at English words, we're going to look at Hebrew and Greek words, the proper use of commentaries, figurative language, apocalyptic literature, and numbers. Uh, Hebrews and hermeneutics, I'm quite excited about that one, if I'm able to get that one together. I'm still working on that one for a while. But the book of Hebrews as a tool for teaching us about hermeneutics, and then uh, application and practical lessons, that's where we're headed. Now, I want to introduce to you the concept of something you already do, and that we already practice, but what it is and how it operates, what's called inductive Bible study. Inductive Bible study. That's what we try to do every Sunday, every Wednesday. That's what we try to do every Sunday morning, Sunday night, is inductive Bible study. And that's what we're after in this class, is inductive Bible study. What, what are we talking about? Let's define it. West says that it simply means inductive Bible study seeks to discover the facts and details in a text to draw conclusions about the meaning of a text from those observations. You say, I didn't get all that. I'm going to summarize this in a minute. Simply put, it means to see what the text says and what it meant to the, original, uh, uh, to the original audience, then make application. I'll make this point more than once. We often look at a text, jump into application, what that means to me, what I got out of that, before we ever see what it actually says, what is the wording of the text, and what did it mean to the original recipient. That's what inductive Bible study is all about. So let's contrast that to a couple of other Bible studies. Inductive Bible studies looks at the text and lets it induce our understanding. Inductive Bible study is an honest approach to the scriptures that says, you know what, I'm going to open up the text. I'm going to read the text. I'm going to be honest and look at the exact wording of the text. And I'm going to let the text guide me to my understanding of what the text says. That's inductive Bible study. In contrast to deductive Bible study, deductive Bible study is where you start with a concept and then you deduce that that is in the text. In other words, I start with my concept, then I'm going to the Bible to try to prove that that's there. I've already got my conclusion. I'm looking where is the passage that teaches that. Rather than taking the passage and then learning what it teaches me rather than me trying to teach the text. There's a big difference in that. Here's another contrast between inductive Bible study and what I call 
quote, spot verse Bible study. Have you ever been in a Bible class like this? We're supposed to be studying through the book of Romans. And so let's say today we're supposed to be studying Romans 5. You might turn over there and me show you what, what we do, often sometimes in Bible class. That the teacher gets up and starts teaching from Romans 5, and he, he says, I want to look down here at verse, um, I want to look at verse, um, I want to look at verse 3, where it talks about tribulation. And he talks about tribulations and trials a little bit, and What's, what is a trial to you? What kind of tribulations have you been through? And so we talk about that for a few minutes. And then he says, I'm, I'm not going to have time to cover every verse, so let's jump, jump down here and let's talk about uh, the righteous man of verse 7. What a righteous man is. And we talk about that for a little bit. And he says, I don't have time to deal with everything, so let's jump down here and let's talk about uh, being enemies, verse 6. You see what I'm doing? There's some good Bible concepts that are developed, but when we get through with the class, what have we not done? We haven't learned anything about Romans 5. We don't know how it fits with the book. We don't know the flow and the thought of Romans 5, nor have we let Romans 5 teach us what the message of Romans 5 was all about. Class doesn't have a clue, and probably the teacher didn't have a clue. All right, that's what we call spot verse Bible study, and... Uh, where you study various topics scattered throughout a chapter, inductive Bible studies where we let this, this text induce the understanding to us. Make sense? That's inductive Bible study. Now here's what it involves. It involves three things. Observation, interpretation, and application. Let's take each one of those. Observation is observing what does the text say. That's what you were doing a while ago, wasn't it? When you read it and you read it again, and you read it again, you were looking to see what the text said. All right, this is where we read, and we read, and we read, and we read, and we read. And then we read. And then what do we do? Read. Read the text. If we accomplish that, we've accomplished a great deal. Now, this is not interpreting. We're just observing and gathering the facts. In other words, um, I'm going to look at the wording of the text. I may not even be interpreting yet. I'm just looking at, particularly on the difficult phrases, I'm going to get the exact wording. Here's what it said. Here's the way it was worded. I'm observing. I'm gathering facts. I'm not drawing many conclusions just yet. I'm going to be looking for answers to these questions. Who is talking and who is he talking about? Who's he talking to? Aren't those good questions? I'm going to raise questions of what is the subject? Where is this going on? When is this going on? It might be talking about something in the future. It may be talking about something in the past. It may be talking about the second coming. It may be talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. I need to know why and how those questions are being asked. If the, I'm just observing. This is observation. All right, I'm going to watch for words that are repeated multiple times, like the word abide in 1 John, or the word love. And you may find a, ver a word that you see repeated over and over and over, and it, that you didn't realize that it was used that many times. Wow, I didn't realize 10 times right here in this chapter. Watch for words that are repeated. Watch for anything that might be grouped together in a list, like the works of the, ma uh, works of the flesh are manifest, and then here they are. The fruit of the Spirit is... Add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, knowledge. To, there's a list. So now I'm beginning to see things. I'm watching for that. I'm observing. I may not know what temperance is, but I know it's one of the things that's to be added to my faith. So I'll come back and interpret later. I'm just, I'm just observing. Does that make sense? Watch for words that indicate a change in topic or time. It may be uh, the next day, like in the book of Acts. All right, we just shifted time. Uh, the next week. Or it may be uh, in the year of certain and such a king. Okay, we just shifted time. We just shifted years. Look for any indication of a reason. Look for the word for. You're all children of God by faith in Christ. For, as many of you have been baptized. Here's the reason to follow. Watch for key words like that. For, 
this show cause and effect. Notice any contrast. You'll see this in 1 John as you read through it. You'll see John talks about one thing, and then he contrasts love and hate, light and darkness, those kinds of things. All right, we're in the observation stage. I like what Martin Booth said. He said, most people read their Bibles like cows stand in the thick grass and trample under feet the finest flowers and herbs. In other words, we're seeing parts of the text, but we may be trampling over some very important... Have you ever done that? Has somebody ever pointed out something in a text that you thought you knew and then come to find out it was right there and I missed that phrase? I don't know how many times I've gone over it. Never saw that phrase at all. I never saw that. And there's a reason for that, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. All right. Here's the second part of inductive Bible study, and that's interpretation. Now I'm asking the question, what does it mean? I'm not prepared to ask what it means until, first of all, I've done my observation. So I suggest we often start here before the observation. In other words, we, we glance at a text, we jump over here to the commentary to find out what it means. There is a place for commentaries. We'll talk about proper use of commentaries. Um, we'll talk about all of that. But we haven't given our observation yet. We haven't even studied the text thoroughly. All right, what's involved in interpretation? I'm going to look at some historical things. I want to know about the history behind this text. In other words, what is the cultural or historical setting of this passage? I want to know something about the author and the recipients. Like Galatians, was it written to an individual? Was it written to a church or to a group of churches? And where are the churches of Galatia? What was the circumstance? Such as being troubled by uh, the Judaizing teachers. All right, I'm going to look at the context. This is one of the most important things you're going to go through. What is the immediate context and then what's the broader context? We're going to have a whole lesson just on context. And so the context sometimes can be something in the same verse. It may be the verse before, verse after. It may be a few verses in either direction. It may be a whole segment of verses. It may be the whole chapter. It may be the book. So what's the immediate context? What is the broader context? This is important. Compatibility. What do we mean by compatibility? is I'm trying to read and interpret this text. Are there other passages that help me understand this in some shape, form, or fashion? It may be a parallel passage like in the Gospels or like Ephesians and Colossians are parallel or Kings and Chronicles being parallel. Is there a parallel text? Uh, are there other passages that deal with this subject? Uh, maybe it's talking about the second coming, and I'm about to draw a conclusion here that's going to violate another passage that's very clear on. So my interpretation is not compatible with that. All right? I'm also looking for, does my interpretation contradict any other passage? Any other principle, any other passage? All right? Then I'm going to look at the textual. I'm going to go back and look at the text again. I'm always safe in going back to the text. And I need to ask, am I making any assumptions in my conclusion? In other words, I would be embarrassed, or could easily be embarrassed, if I, if I come to a conclusion and I tell people, this is what this text means, and when they have to point out to me, you know what, you're assuming this point, and it's not there. For example, that I find that Lydia's household was baptized, and households involve children, and so therefore I know the children were baptized. What am I assuming? that her household involved children. Children are part of a household, but not all households have children, do they? So that's an assumption. That's kind of an obvious one, but there are many assumptions we make. Let key words guide you. Look for the word therefore, the word but, that, for, because, and if. Like if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Key words that are guiding words for us. This is important in interpretation. Always assume, we'll get to this in figurative language, but always assume the literal meaning is what is intended. That's the clearest meaning, unless there's something else that demands otherwise. And we do that in everyday language. If I, and I've given this illustration before, if I said something about, uh, I, uh, here, here recently I almost drowned, if I told you that, you would assume I'm talking about falling into water. 
But I might have been talking about balancing my checkbook in that context. I was drowning in debt, maybe. But if I mention it in the context of a checkbook, you know it's figurative language. But it's safe to assume we always mean words in a literal sense unless there's something that demands otherwise. Assume that of the text, that it must be literal unless I can find some reason to say it has to be figurative. So look for the clearest, easiest meaning. The Bible is not generally written in convoluted language so that I look at it and I've got to figure out some kind of special coded message there somewhere and find out what it's talking about. Generally, it's a simple message. Even the book of Revelation is quite simple from that vantage point. Make sense? All right, we've got two parts of this. All right, now we're ready for application. What does it mean to me? What does it mean to me? Now, we're, we're not just, I like what Wes said. He said, we're not just trying to get through the Bible. We're trying to let the Bible get through us. I like that. So I'm not going to spend much time here. Our last lesson in the whole series is going to be more on this. But we're going to look for promises I need to believe, commands I need to obey, examples I need to follow, doctrines I need to accept, warnings I need to heed, etc. We're looking for practical application. What does this passage do for us? What do I learn from it? And that's part of, of what we're trying to do. Now, the text has boundaries. Every text has boundaries. What does that mean? It has limitations. All right, it's limited by other texts, by what God has said and what God intended. A text cannot mean anything and everything. It just can't. Your words cannot mean anything and everything. Because that's not what you intended. You didn't mean anything by what you said. You had a certain idea in mind. You may be mistaken. Somebody may mistake what you say, but it has a certain meaning. Hughes said any word, any text, any statement, which is not nonsense, has somewhere a boundary to its meaning. I like that. There's only one meaning, and that's what the original author intended. West goes on to say every verse has only one intended meaning, even though it may have many applications. The Bible isn't written to mean different things to different people. Uh, otherwise, uh, the issue in every verse is always what God means by it and, what, and not what it means to me. I think we make a mistake in Bible class sometimes. What does this passage mean to you? Like this passage tells me one message, but it tells you something else, contradictory. And that's not how the Bible operates. God has one intended message, and hermeneutics has to do with gleaning that and, bring, and exegesis has to do with bringing that out. Does that make sense? So we have boundaries, and that's why we have rules of hermeneutics. Now I want to quickly hit this and, and go to the last thing, and then we're going to go to 2 Corinthians 6. Next week we won't have as much class delivery material, so we're going to get to a couple of other things. Let's talk about how and where we learn. How do we learn hermeneutics? Now listen carefully to this because this may sound like a rebuke, and it doesn't. I, I want this to be more of an admonition than a rebuke. How do we learn about hermeneutics? We can learn about hermeneutics from this class and from other studies. If you want references, out there's just a world of books on hermeneutics out there. Some of them uh, way over our heads. Some of them are quite simple. There's just a world of books, more than you can ever read. And so you can learn about hermeneutics and about Bible principles of how to interpret the text, how to study the text. But there's another way about learning hermeneutics. How would you learn about hermeneutics? Something every one of you have access to. Everybody didn't have access to the internet. By reading the Bible, that's one. Somebody asked me some time ago, said, uh, I want to learn how to teach. I'm, I'm, I'm going to illustrate this with another subject. I want to learn how to teach an adult Bible class. I don't know how to teach an adult Bible class. And they had been sitting in my Bible classes for 10 years. And my response was, I've been showing you for 10 years. Does that make sense? I've been showing you for 10 years. Just watch. <laughs> if I teach you, I'm going to be showing you and telling you exactly what I just did, done for the last 10 years. So what I'm saying is every sermon, every class is a study of hermeneutics. Does that make sense? This, I don't mean that as a rebuke that, okay, you want to study hermeneutics. You should already know that. The point is every textual study uses and demonstrates hermeneutics. Every sermon does that. 
Because conclusions generally are driven by evidence. The sermons that I do, other preachers that we have in here, other teachers besides me here, most of the time, there may be exceptions, but most of the time, this passage means, and then we supply the evidence why we think it means that. How we drive that conclusion. I know that because of the context. We're just showing hermeneutics is what we're doing. So why don't we learn hermeneutics from that? I think there's one simple reason. Watch this carefully. We're not learning the principles because we listen for the conclusion without paying attention to the evidence. Does that make sense? That is, we, we listen, what, what does that passage mean? Oh, it means that. Without listening to the evidence that the teacher just gave. Where he just demonstrated hermeneutics. And exegesis, how he arrived at that. Make sense? So I'm interested when some guy says, this passage means, I want to hear more. I'm, I, I know that's what you say. I want to know why you think that. How did you come to that conclusion? What principles of hermeneutics did you use? Does that make sense? That's how we learn hermeneutics. One more thing. Let's talk about some basic things, and I'm going to list these quickly. And uh, this, we're going to come back to this every time we have class. And I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. Here's some basics that we're going, and we're going to have deeper dives through the study, but we're going to stick with the basics because everybody present can follow the basics. So we're not going to lose anybody. We're going to keep two levels going. Here are the basics that are involved in Bible interpretation. Go to the text first and read and read and reread and read and reread, okay? That's the, that's the, the greatest thing you can do. Secondly, what I do when I'm trying to interpret a text is then I look at various translations. Even some that are not good translations sometimes can serve as a good commentary. I want to know what this, common, what this translator thought that passage was saying. And I find that quite helpful at times. That here is another translation that enlightens me on that. Here's a difficult phrase. And I'm finding the, the translation helps me out. I'm going to look up words. And you can do that without knowing your Greek or Hebrew. We'll, we'll talk about that later in some Bible study aids. Watch for structure and thought patterns. In other words, these four verses are talking about faith, and it seems that these next six verses are talking about action. That's a thought pattern. That helps me to see the text a little better. My question needs to be, what does this mean to the original audience? I'm not ready for application to me. I'm looking for what does it mean to the original audience. I need to look at that before I make application to us. This is not original with me. Someone raised this question. I thought this was a brilliant question. If the original writer were to be present, Paul, for example, and you're teaching Romans 5 or you're, you're telling somebody, here's what Romans 5 means, and Paul were to be sitting in the audience, would he give approval to your conclusion, your interpretation, your application, or would he say, that's not what I had in mind at all? <laughs> That's a good question, isn't it? What would the original writer think about that? That's a good question. And then we're looking for some application. And when you do that, when you say, okay, here's the text, here's some other translations, here's what these words mean, I've got the understanding of the text, and here's what it means to the original recipient, here's what it means in application to us, what more do we want from Bible study? Make sense? All right, that took a little longer than I meant for it to but what we're going to do throughout is keep two, two levels going. When we go into, for example, looking at Hebrew and Greek words, we're going to go a little deeper in some things that some are going to say, I'm not, I can't do that. Well, we're going to keep you on this, this, this basic level. We're going to keep that going all throughout our study, and then we're going to take some deeper dives, and we're not going to lose anybody, but we're going to take some deeper dives. Does that make sense? So when we take those deeper dives, we're coming back to the surface. So you stay there in the boat, and we're coming back, okay? We're going to come back to you. That's what we're going to do. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 6 and in 14 now um, and talk about that passage. The 1 Corinthians 15 passage we will not get to tonight. We won't even finish 2 Corinthians. I've handed to you Matthew 24. So just keep those and we're going to look at those in that sequence as we have time. We'll have more time, I promise, next week because will there not be as much information to disseminate. All right, how do we go about in, uh, interpreting and, and this is what this is about. We're not just trying to study 2 Corinthians 6, 14. We want to exercise principles of how we go about interpreting that. So just for somebody to say, it's not talking about, that doesn't mean anything to me, until we show why and how we go about studying. So the question is, 2 Corinthians 6, 14, that uh, what is this passage saying? And 
does it apply to a Christian marrying a non-Christian? Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. How would we go about studying this text? The first thing ought to be, and then what? Read and keep reading. Because what I think the text is saying may not be what it's saying. I've found that true many times. I keep reading it, and in my mind, I'm making it say something. And that's not what it said. The more I read it, that's not what it says. All right, so we're going to spend some time. So let's pretend we spent a lot of time reading, and we've read, and we've read, and we're... But besides that verse, now what am I going to read? Read the chapter. All right, so I'm going to read the context, which... I may just look at a few verses before and a few verses after, but that's probably not going to give me in this chapter the full picture. So I'm going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 6, the entirety. And I'm going to read it through several times to get the gist of what that's all about. Now what am I going to find when when I'm looking at the context? Let's just start with context. What's the start with the chapter? What basically, what's the thrust of the chapter? All right, he's talking about some hardships. All right, talk about how to serve God. It talks about the ministry that was introduced in chapter 3, dealt with in chapter 4, chapter 5, and chapter 6. Some think chapters 4, 5, and 6 grouped together as a unit of chapters. Probably so, I think so. But be that as it may, it deals with some things that are demanded of us in the ministry. As I read it, I keep seeing that point. Now, let's pretend we've come to that conclusion. The first five verses talks about, here's one of the things that's demanded of us, that we should walk worthy. So here's something God demands of us to to live the Christian life. Beginning at verse 14 through 18, his point seems to be, Separate from the world, absolutely. We're to live separate from the world. And so I go back and, well, let me make sure I've got that. So I'm probably am going to go back and read that section again. Oh, yeah, that's, that's coming through clear, being separate from the world. Now let's focus on that section. What, does he, what kind of things does he talk about? There's being unequally yoked together. I'm not sure what that means yet. I'm pretending I don't know yet. All right, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. There's other phrases found here. All right, good. There's contrast. Remember we said a moment ago, start watching for contrast. What Diane just mentioned was there's several contrasts. Here's the believer and unbeliever, righteousness, and so on down the line. Here's several contrasts. And they're not to have fellowship one with the other. So I'm seeing a pattern of thought from the, I haven't gone to a commentary yet. I haven't gone to another passage yet. I've learned this from reading and reading and rereading the text. Does that make sense? That's our greatest tool. You say, I wish I had some good Bible study too. Can you read and do you have a Bible? There's one of your best tools you'll ever have. Just read from the context. All right, verse 17 says, this is going to be an important point. Concerning our relationship with the world, we are to come out from among them and be separate. All right. Now, what else do I need to do in interpreting this text? All right. What is that going to tell me? All right, and, and so there was a, the danger, as we saw in chapter uh, 5, that there's a danger in going back to that kind of, uh, of uh, lifestyle. All right, good point, good point. Let's talk about compatibility. 
uh, we've, we, 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 let's pretend we've already gone through the historical, and, and that's what Drew just did for us over here. He did our historical study, and he gave us an hour dissertation on that. We pretend. All right. So we've been through that, and we know the historical. We've looked at the context. Let's talk about compatibility. If I'm trying to interpret this text, and I'm, I'm thinking it might be, let's just pretend I'm thinking it, it's talking about a Christian marrying a non-Christian, forbidding that. Does, is that compatible or incompatible with other texts? Incompatible. What do you mean? What, what text are we talking about? All right. Whatever this relationship is in this context, you're to come out and be separate from that. Most of those who, not everybody, but most of those who think it's talking about marrying a non-Christian, when I ask them, do you think they ought to divorce? Oh, no, I don't think they should divorce. I just think they should have never married them in the first place. Well, this one says come out and be separate to end that relationship. There's another passage that I think we need to talk about. 1 Corinthians 7, what did we learn there? Go ahead. All right, 1 Corinthians 7, 12 and 13, and I'm going to paraphrase in the interest of time, so let's pretend we've been over there and we've been digging into that, and we saw that 1 Corinthians 7, 12 and 13 says that if, if a Christian is married to a non-Christian, when they obey the gospel, don't leave them, but stay in that relationship. But this relationship says come out. So I have to conclude, finish my sentence. He's not talking about the same thing. So this, while it may not be advisable, may not be wise to marry a non-Christian, this passage isn't talking about that. And you say, I still think the Bible says it's wrong. You're going to have to find another text. Go hunting for another text. Not this one. This is not going to work. So the question is, and I think now we, we, by looking at the context, compatibility especially, that helped me unlock what it doesn't mean. What does it mean? Now, What's it saying? Don't be unequally yoked together. You can't be a follower of God and trust God in the world as well. All right. The reason some think it refers to marriage is because the term yoke is used here. The unequally yoked means to be mismatched. The lexicographers say that's what it means. So you say, I don't have all those tools. You have access to that, and we're going to talk about that in the, in the, uh, uh, later in one of our studies. But it has the idea of oxen being mis mismatched. You don't put an oxen here and then put a donkey in there pulling with him. They're mismatched. And so here is a worldly person, a sinner, pulling the load of sin, and you don't get in the harness with them. You're mismatched. Does that make sense? So don't get in the yoke with them. Uh, other translations would help me. Do not be mismatched with unbelievers, Holman Christian. The NET says don't become partakers with those who do not believe. It just simply means to partake in their sin. The word fellowship is used in the context. Uh, the word communion, accord, agreement. Does that make sense? All right. Here's my question. I know that was a hurried look, and we had to pretend we were spending a lot of time with that, and we're going to do that several times because we don't have time to, uh, to take 2 Corinthians 6 in class in half the time and, and just go on and on and on. We don't have time for that. But the, one last question, we're done. How many found that exercise of trying to figure that out using some principles that you already knew uh, worthwhile for you? More challenging than just studying for a class on 2 Corinthians. Nobody? Several of you, all right. Next week, we will cover 1 Corinthians 15, 29. May get into Matthew 24, but I doubt it. So we're probably going to be just a little behind on that and because that is a tough text, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 29. Uh, so if you get lost on that, there are 200 interpretations out there on that verse.